we find church in these times. That sometimes we need to be reminded of the time when we first was emerged into that baptism pool. When we came up with the zest and the feeling of the Holy Spirit. Before Satan could get a hold to you. Before Satan could try to weigh you down with some of the things that used to be. Just take me back. When well, your faith has not been tested, it's fully strong. Lord, I just need to be reminded of the day when you first came in our life. Take me back, Lord, where I first believed. Because during these times, church, Jesus is soon to come. We can tell by the type of president we have. When he does not care whether or not other people are off for a month or for a year, he's going to shut it down because of a wall. Now, church, I don't care whether or not you're Republican or Democrat or Independent. Right is right. Right is right and wrong is wrong and you can't justify wrong. Amen? We're in a days and time where a mother just goes to Walmart just to get some breakfast for a kid. Mother end up in the hospital and the child end up on a cooling board. We're in the time that a show can come on fatal attraction and have several episodes of people doing things that they shouldn't be doing. The devil is busy like never before. So sometimes we just need to be taken back to know that God is who he is. And because he is able to do above all that you can ask for or think, just take me back. Lord, remind me of the time when I was in your arms. We find today the text of the day, we're going to look at Romans. Is that the Old Testament or New Testament? Can I hear it, Old Testament or New Testament? That means you are able to find it real fast. It's in the New Testament. Romans chapter 8, verses 28. Romans chapter 8, verses 28. For those who do not have it, say, wait a minute. For those who have it, say, go ahead, pastor or preacher. It should be behind me and behind in front of me. Romans chapter 8, verses 28. Let's read it together. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who be called according to his purpose. Let me, re let me read it for you. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Today I'm simply going to try to preach on whose house is this. Let us pray the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, give me strength, and you have redeemed us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. The word says, 28, Romans 8. Chapter 28 simply says, And we know that all things work together for good to them. When we look at the text of the Lord, we have to look at what it says, line upon line, precept on precept, purely fidelity. That means that I can take a text from, from one verse, one chapter, Put it with another text from another verse, another chapter, and they should say the same thing. 
I could take a verse and text from one chapter, move it to another text and another chapter, and it should say pretty much the same thing. In other words, it's just like when you do arithmetic. One plus one equals two. Two minus one equals one. Is that correct? So anywhere you go, whether or not you're in Japan, whether or not you're in America, one plus one equals what? Amen. So it's equals. And it is correct. You can check on every uh, mathematical computation. You can check it. That's how you know whether or not you're going to get an A or whether or not you're going to get a C. Because if you don't check it, it may be wrong. Amen? Let's look at this. This last time I was up, I talked about, if, do you all remember? Get your house in order. Get your house in order. We went over the different texts that showed you what did you need to get your house in order. Now, we wasn't talking about the house that you build, your home. We're talking about your spiritual house. There are certain things that you need to do your spirit for your spiritual house to be in order. We looked at, I'm just going to quickly go through these. You do not have to put them up on the board. But we looked at, first you have to purchase the land. We looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 20. It says that you know that your body is a temple of God. And you are bought with a price. That's 1 Corinthians. Secondly, we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 17. You need a blueprint in order to build a new building. So God has given you that through the scripture. It says all scripture are given by the inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof and correction. If you build in a house and your blueprint is wrong, Guess what? It may sway a little bit, or it may fall on you. Thirdly, we looked at John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, which says, in order to build the house, you need to clear off what? The land. It needs to be on solid ground. Fourthly, we looked at if you want a real good house, you don't get any builder. You get who? The master builder. And it says, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of, of our faith. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2. Then finally, to build the house, you must have a good foundation. Matthew chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, it says, For on this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. That's been two or three years ago when I preached this message. So I imagine that from that time to this time, we have had many types of homes we build. Some of us have built mansions because we are in the anointing of Jesus by that. Some of us have had certain type of house that had the what's called a tankless water heater. We did had a couple upgrades to our house by now. We had porcelain tile, it's still a regular tile, or hardwood floors. We have changed the paint from the standard paint of eggplant to canary yellow or orange. We have updated the house a little bit. And still again, the regular cabinets, we got the, the most expensive cabinet. It's still the regular eight-foot door. We have the 12-foot door. So some of us, since I, you built your home, you have improved it, and it's looking good. But also, let's be reminded, but since you built your house, that don't mean Satan is not going to come by and visit you. So today in your life, you may, at this point, because of the tornadoes or the winds and the waves, you may be in a rebuilding process. Some of us may be in a renovation process. Some of us may just be tiling up, picking up the dirt, because all is still well with God. 
So today, the question is, whose house is this? Is God still in control? Or, or have we succumbed to Achanism? We remember Achan, right? Do we recall Achan? Let me tell you a little bit about Achan. The children of Israel had just conquered Jericho. The Lord told the children of Israel to come, go in and only to take certain things, the gold, the silver, the precious metals, and that is for the Lord. But Achan saw an opportunity to get a come up. In other words, pimping the Lord and the children of Israel. Get an opportunity to get a come up. So Achan stole some things and hid it in his tent. In his tent. And not only did he steal it and hid it, he lied about it. What Achan called cost in this situation was over 3,600 children of Israel lost their life because of Achanism, stealing, deception in the children of Israel. Now, Achan come from the tribe of Judah. It was no excuse for Achan to take that. Not only did he cause his life, he caused his children life, his wife life. Everybody was part of Achan, even the sheep had to go. We have to be careful, church, about bringing into this house deceit, lies, stealing, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. In this church, because it may not, you may not see the effect right now, but for every action, there is an opposite, equal, or greater reaction. Achanism caused 3,600 people to lose their life because he stole or he was disobeyed, disobedient to God. Question. What is it you do? You have to take an introspective look at yourself. You have to take an introspective look at yourself. Every beginning of the year, you make these resolutions. These resolutions sometimes are the same as the resolution before. Because you didn't start it, or you didn't measure up. Over and over again, right? But what's important about a resolution is this. At least you know that there's something you need to improve upon. That means you have looked at your situation and come to a conclusion that there needs to be a change. What's wrong with grown people is that there is no one can tell you nothing. I'm 21. You can't tell me nothing. I'm grown. Not understanding that grown grownness of being grown take on a different form and a different responsibility. To be grown means that you are taking on responsibility to do the right thing without supervision. When I was a child, I spake as a child. But now that I'm grown, I should put all foolish and childish ways. Question. When we first came into the church, are you the same way as you were then? Or are we now leading out in song service, in prayer, the prayer warriors, in telling someone about the word of God? At some point, we got to grow up and tell somebody else about the love of Jesus or these pews or these seats will be empty. Because we're going to surely get older. Is that right? So who houses it? If, it, if we standing on the Lord's side, surely he has the power to move mountains, to 
do anything that he said that he's going to do. He can do everything that he says he's going to do. And he will do everything he said he's going to do. So the question is, have we succumbed to atheism? Backbiting. Or taking things just for myself. Am I over this ministry so I'm not going to care about the other ministry? Our, our minds is doing good. Are they over there? The children of Israel had 12 tribes. Achan was part of Judah. But um, 3,600 wasn't just of the Judah tribe. Whatever you do in the church affects everybody in the church because we all are a part of, a, a part of the body of this house. What you say, what you do, is a reflection of us what? Us all. Sometimes these days, church, we can't tell a seven-day Adventist for, from a Baptist. Seems like in the church we have come more trying to do what the Baptists used to do 20 years ago and 30 years ago. And guess what? The Baptists trying to do what we was doing. They stole, hey, we had the help message. Did we not? The whole world has it now. What about, well, what about Revelation? We know when Jesus is coming. They're trying to get their house in order. They're not trying to sing, dance, all that in the church. They're trying to hear the word of God because they know that's the only way you're going to be saved. We can come through that door every, 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 every Sabbath and still be lost if you turn around and go back the way that you came without a conversion. We can go and get in this pool, this baptism pool, every Sabbath, but guess what? You can go down a center and get up a wet center. There has to be a conversion. There has to be a change. When you know the man with the plan from Galilee, there is a conversion. He wipes out all sins. You become new. You don't have to be ashamed what you did in the past because Jesus just said, I forgot it. What was that? Many times that's how Satan gets us. Guess what he does? He sit there and remind you of 10 years ago or 15 years ago when you was a child, a teenager, or even last year and say, well, you remember you did that? Somebody going to catch you and say something about you. So we don't get up and do the will of God. He tried to hold that over you. But Jesus said he will wipe away all sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of what? All unrighteousness. If Achanism is in here, the question is, why? Why do we do the things we do? Is there a justification? Inquirers minds want to know. Is there a justification? Now, now people always say, well, that's just my personality. There's 12 gates to the city. All you have to do is catch one. So he made it so that those 12 different personalities, oh, you can get through the city if you're right with God. But are you causing confusion? And is your righteousness as filtered grass? In other people, I say, Jesus said that he would wipe away all that. The blood of the land would cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That also includes sin. He says sin and all unrighteousness. Sometimes your righteousness could, could also keep you from the kingdom of heaven. Now, guess what? what? Wouldn't it be a shame but that you have no sin, but the confusion you cause in the church keep you out the pearly gates? Lord, I didn't lie. I didn't commit a dungeon. I kept the silent. I honored my father and my mother. I had no other God before me. But you was a stumbling block. You causes someone else to stumble. 
And what he said, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Depart from me. Wouldn't that be a shame? We have to get right because Jesus is soon to come. When we see the signs of the times, we know. We, we all been to the Revelation seminar. If we haven't, we need to start because it tells us that we at the end days. Amen? So while we worry about this and worry about that and this conversation that shouldn't be acceptable in God's sight, we should be giving our life together. Get your house in order. Some of our houses need renovation. So that means some of us need to go back, take me back. Dear Lord, where you first believed, tear it down and build it back up on solid rocks. Amen? We're going to move on. So when we look at the text, now I'm not going to hold you long, Sister Ayala. Or Sister Mickens. She already gave me a cue. Y'all know when you see her stand up, it's time for me to what? She already know. Amen. So don't be surprised. In the middle of a sentence, I begin to go take my seat. Oh, don't get it twisted. I run my house when she said when she says okay. Don't get it twisted. All right? So so if, if in between words you see her standing up. Amen. Baby, I put the time on, so we're going to make this short. Amen? So in the text, so I got to make it quick. She said I already have 10 minutes. To make it quick, we'll make it quick. Romans 28 Verses 28, we're going to look precept on precept, line upon line, and hear a little, there a little. And it says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. The first question, we have three questions, probably, possibly four. Three questions we must ask of this text. Number one, what is all these things God talking about in the text? What is all of these things working together for good? that he's talking about. I'm glad you asked. Third John chapter two, chapter one, verses two said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in good health. So in his text, in, in, in Romans 8, 28, he promising you prosperity and health as your soul prosper. What else is God promising in Romans 8, 28? If you look at James chapter 4, verses 7, he says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Resist the devil, and he will what? Get out of town. Resist the devil, and he will what? Get gone in the hurry. So what he, he give you the power to tell the devil, go away. So now he's giving you prosperity. He's giving you good health, and he's giving you the power to tell the devil, get out of here. This is not your home. This is the Lord's house. Whose house is this? This is the Lord's house. Get out of here. Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord, and only him shall thou serve. Get out of here. Now, if you look back in the old Bible days, in a lot of the parables, in a lot of the situations, they thought that proximity causes a blessing. That means that they didn't know. They felt like I had to touch the hem of his garment to be saved. I had to touch the hem of his garment to be healed. That is not the case. Is that not the case? Because you have faith, he didn't say that if you resist the devil, he said if you resist the devil, he, he didn't say you had to go there. In many other situations, even with Lazarus, they said, Jesus, if you had been here. So they felt like Jesus had to be in here, right side me, in order for me to be saved, or in order for me to get healed. Is that the case now? 
can we cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, touch my child. Lord, I know that my child is going to uh, rebuke the devil right now, Lord, and sh it shall be done. Can we not do that? So we have the power. God said he would give us prosperity. He would give us good health. He would increase our soul, our communication with him. Not only that, we have the power to resist the devil. Tell him to get out of here. If we look at Matthew chapter 17, verses 8, he said unto him, if you have the faith, the size of the mustard seed, you can move mountains. Amen? So not only can we resist the devil, as I said earlier, we can say, mountain be thou removed, and it shall move. That person that bullied you at school, be thou removed. That person that keeping you from getting an advancement at your job, be thou removed. I don't know what your, your mountain experience is today, but in the name of Jesus, you can say, be thou removed, and it will move. The word of God even goes a little bit farther and said, you can tell the sycamore tree to get up, be unrooted, and move to the sea and plant it there, and it shall do that. The question is, how is your faith? We have the power to do it. What else is all these things that Jesus said, said we could do? We look at Psalms chapter 23, verses 4. It says, in summation, great goodness and mercy should follow you in all days of your life. Goodness and mercy should follow you in all the days of your life. Haven't he given you enough for you to overcome the devil? Have he not? The question is, has he? Have he not? Can you, do, do you have the power to resist him? Romans 8, 28 says you do. Because he says he would give you all of these things. What are all of these things? The second question we must ask, once we have determined that what all these things are, who love God? Because the text says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Second question. Who love God? The choir reminds one to know. Who love God? Jesus simply says, if you love me, do what? If you love me, keep my commandments. So we know that those that love God and keep his commandments are those that we're talking about in this chapter. Amen? Did, did the word say that? So, I guess that it excludes certain people. This text excludes certain people. It's only talking to the one that love God. It's only talking to the ones that keep his commandments. And if you're doing that, all of these things that I just talked about, you can have. That's, no, that's, that's number two. Number three, to them that are called. Who are them that are called? The question is right now. We find that answer in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9. Who are the called? And 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 9 it says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering long suffering to upwards not willing that any perish but that all should have should come to repentance what do that mean that's self explanatory he wants all of us to be saved he wants all of us to have the goodness he wants all of us to keep the commandment, but there are certain things that you must do, certain attributes that you must have in order to get the goodness and blessing. The question is, if you're going through trouble after trouble after trouble after trouble, 
over the same, 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 same thing, have you not learned to change the things that you're doing? If I'm applying for a $150,000 job, and the only thing I put on the job is that I did customer service 30 years ago. How can I expect to get the job? Or I walk into a place who said they're hiring a $150,000 job, and I walk in without a resume. And I keep doing that over and over, over again. I get the same, 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 same result. At some point, we should recognize that we need to change what we do. If you are at the same point you were at 15 years ago and you had not been transcended up to heaven, that means possibly you need to change things. If you're driving the same car that you drove 25 years ago, and you have to push it most of the time. <laughs> there should be an indicator, not just the oil light being on, just not the, not the lights just flashing on the dash dashboard. There should be an indicator that you need to change. Amen. I will move on. But God is talking about all of us. He wished that all of us be prosperous and in good health. He wished that we all help him. He, he has the protection. What else is this text saying? It says, to them that are called, that's all of us, according to his purpose. So the, question, the last question is, what is God's purpose? What is God's purpose? deal with three texts. Number one, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17. He says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to do what? So that, does, does that mean his law has been done away with? Does that mean that his law was abolished? Does that mean we no longer has to keep the law? Is that yes or no? I can't hear you. So, so we're looking at this and he says, he came as an example to fulfill what? The law. Secondly, John 10 verses 10 says, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that ye may have life, and that it may have it more abundant. What? Abundantly. So not only did he come to, to not destroy the law, but he wanted you to have the good life. He wants you to have the good life. So let me ask you this. If there are bullies on Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, all these things, is that living a good life? If you're going through bullies at school, every, every day you go, is that the good life? Is that? If you have to deal with those type of people every day and it's pressing on your heart, tell me whether or not that's the good life. Is it? Yes or no? That means that at this point, what God wants from you, for you, you don't have it. If you going through trials and trials and trials, day after day, year after year, month after month, and you have not overcome it, that's not what God wants for you. That's not for you. That means that possibly you need to step back and still going before God 
get in line with God and let him begin to what? Order your steps. Because when he order your steps, you can't get out of line. Because he's told you in, in Romans 8 verses 28 that he wants you to have all these things. In all these things that we talk about, with any of those negative? Now, like Job, there will come a test. We remember God's test, right? Do we remember when Jesus got tested after the 40 days and 40 nights? You remember that? That Satan came to him after 40 days and tempted God? Now, guess what? Satan didn't just come one time. He had to rebuke Satan four times. Finally, he says, it is written, thou should not worship any, any, any God. You see what I'm saying? He's, he had to rebuke the Satan by temptation of food, authority, and power. Then Jesus finally says, Satan, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. So Jesus didn't use his own perception or pragmatic thought. He used what Jesus said. He didn't use logic. He used spiritual. He used the word of God. Now, what happens many times in this Achanism is this. We like to do things practical. It's practical. So we'll do it. That means we have, when you do things practical or pragmatic, it means that you have really no basis for doing it. It just sounds good or it seems good. When we do it logically, that means that we have seen, we have something tangible that we saw the results of it that so we try that method. It's a little better than pragmatic. It's a little better. But when we are led by the Spirit, guess what? You can't come up wrong. When God is leading you and you let him order your steps, whatever situation you is, you are a winner. Can someone say amen? Am I right about it? Finally, John chapter 14, verses 6. And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by who? But by me. Meaning that Jesus just didn't put you on the island by yourself. He gave you Romans 8, 28, but above all things, he showed you the way to salvation. You know what? I never, I never um, failed a test that the instructor gave me the lesson plan. He gave me the answer to the test. Then the day before the test, he sent me the test. Now, as a result, you know when you're going to school, if you pass your class, every test, every quiz, that means you have what? A 100. That means you can't fail the, test, fail the class, right? That means you have a four-point GPA. Jesus not only gave us the test, he walked in it to proofread the test, and then turn around and said, now I have passed the test, walk ye in it. So why are we trying to do our own thing? It's my prerogative. You gonna mess around and say that right in hell. It's my prerogative. Why are you burning? And at that point, you can't say, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Because he said, I never knew you. So the question is, whose house is this? Is this a house of, of paganism? Is it a house of Achanism, or this is a house of the Lord, thy God? Now, it doesn't mean that, that things are not perfect. Because when, it, when things are diverse, that means we have different ideals, different ways of looking at things, different backgrounds, different environments. But it says all things work together for good. That means when we make a decision, it's not only pleasing to me pleasing to everybody around me. I am not only thinking being selfish, 
less, but I'm not being selfish. So it's not about me. In this house, we make decisions that is beneficial for children ministry, women ministry, family ministry, boys, girls, women, everything. We make decisions based off of that. Not because my ministry is doing good. And I don't care about your ministry. In 2019, we need to take an introspective look at ourselves, the way that we do things, the way that we have done things in the past. And if it has not proven to bring a soul in to Christ, to bring somebody else in this door, or if a person has come through that door and our personality, our action causes them to leave, Guess what you need to do in 2019? Change it. We're not changing because just to change. We're changing because it's what God said do. And when we do what he said do, we are on the right path. Now, I'm going to take my seat. But before I take my seat, I want to let you know this. Salvation is easy. The decision of salvation is easy. The only problem is if we get out of our way and let God do the rest. If we get out our way, get out of our feelings, get out of someone that did us wrong in the past, and this person looks similar, similar to that person, get out our way and let God do the rest. Brother Johnson, the other week, posted something on Facebook. Now, I'm not a person, I, I look at the post, but I'm not a person that typically respond to any type of post. But Brother Z Johnson, Vernon Johnson posted something that is a, we call a rally cry for all Christians. If you have not seen it, you need to ask him about it. And it's simple. We are Christians because we believe what God said. And because we believe what God said, we would do what he says. You have nothing to lose by doing what God said. But if you don't do what God said, guess what? Good luck. 